fossil fuels will be here for many, many years to come. China's building a gigawatt a week of coal burning power plants. At the moment, we're burning fossil fuels in power stations that are very inefficient. Across the world, ever-increasing carbon emissions are forcing the pace of climate change. The main culprit, the wide-scale combustion of fossil fuels. Now, from nuclear power to renewables, there's intense pressure to find clean, sustainable alternatives. But while resources of oil, gas and coal are finite, the hard truth is, Fossil fuels are here for decades to come. This film will explore how carbon capture and storage, or CCS, could be a significant way forward in cutting global emissions. There's no way over the next few decades we can shift the whole of the planet's energy system into non-fossil based energy and we have to get to at least 60% reduction globally in CO2 emissions by the middle of this century. That means we have to deploy technologies such as carbon capture and storage urgently. CCS involves capturing the carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion and storing it below the Earth's surface in old oil wells, coal mines or water-bearing rock strata known as saline aquifers for tens of thousands of years. There are two uh, main technologies. One is to capture from the uh, exhaust gases of burning the fossil fuel, for instance, in a large power plant from the smokestack, and you use solvents to capture the CO2 from there. And that's known as post-combustion capture. Pre-combustion capture is where we remove the carbon from the fossil fuel before we use the fuel. Now, a classic example is natural gas. Pre-combustion capture using natural gas is the approach being developed by BP in Scotland. The Peterhead project will take a, a stream of natural gas from the national transmission system into a process that's called reforming, where it will create a gas called syngas, which is made up of two elements, hydrogen and carbon monoxide. We will then take it through another step, which will convert the carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide which we can then capture and separate from the hydrogen. The hydrogen is then used and as feedstock to the power station uh, where it generates 500 megawatts of electricity. And the CO2 stream is then moved through a pipeline to the Miller Reservoir. Injecting CO2 also forces extra oil from the well. This enhanced oil recovery should extend the life of the Miller oil field for many years. Good news for BP, but there are concerns. If we're hoping to reduce emissions through the use of carbon capture and storage, we must take into account the fact that we are at the same time producing more oil. So we are reducing emissions somewhere, but we're also going to be causing more emissions when these fossil fuels, when the oil is burnt in cars, for example. A million tonnes of coal awaits the furnaces of Eon's power station near Nottingham, which on full power eats 800 tonnes an hour. When burnt, it will emit two and a half million tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere. Eon is keen to reduce its carbon footprint. Eon UK has recognised that there are several technologies that could be applied to coal-fired power stations. In order to take clean coal forward, then there will need to be some full-scale commercially operated power plant with carbon capture and storage and therefore it is looking seriously at a project on the east coast of England. If commissioned, Eon's coal-fired power station will be built at Killingholm in Lincolnshire. With its built-in post-combustion capture facility, it will be one of the first of its type in the world. But there are hundreds of power stations across the globe that will need to be adapted and retrofitted with carbon capture technology. Ideally, you want to build plant without retrofitting. You want to build it right up from the start, designed in capture. That's the cheapest option. But we have this huge legacy of power plant. And even now, as I speak, China's building a gigawatt a week of coal burning power plants. So we have to be able to get to this retrofit stage with, with the more modern power plants, certainly. The really old power plants are probably best being abandoned and, and not retrofitted. This 3D visualisation shows the UK's carbon storage potential beneath its landmass and offshore, 
But before this can be exploited, environmental agencies are seeking assurances about the long-term integrity of the process. Friends of the Earth and other environmental groups used to have some very serious concerns about carbon capture and storage. We feared that it, it would divert technology and it would divert resources away from renewable energy and energy conservation. We still believe that renewables and energy efficiency should be the priority for all governments. Carbon capture and storage could have a role to play potentially in the future under certain conditions. And these conditions are that we really get some guarantees that the gases that are stored underground really do stay there for thousands of years. If they start to leak out, obviously, um, that will not be very good for the climate. The Norwegian oil company Statoil has been injecting CO2 into a saline aquifer in the Sleipner field in the North Sea since 1996. Geologists are confident it will stay put. Here we have a visualisation of the Sleipner CO2 storage project. We're looking through the water column, through the seabed, through about 800 metres of rock. And as we start to move the visualisation around, you'll see this plume of layers of blue and yellow. This is the plume of carbon dioxide that's been injected into this sandstone interval, the base of which is about a kilometre beneath the seabed. And the CO2 is injected in the base of the formation as a dense liquid phase CO2. But of course you can see the CO2's got to the very top of the sandstone layer and not got any further. And this is exactly what we expect because the clay layer above that is hundreds of meters thick and it's impossible for the CO2 to get through. So this is a very, very secure project for storing CO2. Scientists at the British Geological Survey are continually monitoring and testing rock samples from sites like the Sleipner and Miller fields. The samples we're working on in the laboratory come from real field situations. These are real rocks. We have to know what's happening with the real rocks where we're likely to store CO2. While scientists and engineers are pushing this technology forward, it will inevitably add to the cost of producing energy. So a programme of support for carbon capture and storage is essential to build industry capacity. Companies like E.ON and BP are calling on the government to provide financial incentives. Governments just need to make their choices and make it clear to companies who are prepared to invest that they're prepared to support that technology. The ball is very much in the court of society. Are they prepared to pay for it? And the politicians, are they prepared to uh, negotiate and uh, enable these technologies through proper regulation, permitting, etc., and fiscal incentives? It's recognised that carbon capture and storage should be used as a bridging technology, a means of reducing emissions while clean and sustainable energy is developed. There's a very short window of time now for us to harness the existing North Sea infrastructure. Uh, the UK oil and gas production peaked in 1999 and it's going to drop away very dramatically, regardless of the price of oil and gas, simply because there's a limit to how much oil and gas you can get out. That's geology that limits things eventually. And we're going to see a major decommissioning of that North Sea infrastructure, pipelines, platforms, fields, all of which could form the infrastructure for storing, distributing and storing CO2 out in the North Sea. So, Things have to happen very quickly over the next 15, 20 years, I think, if we're really going to maximise our opportunity of storing a lot of CO2 under the North Sea. And there's enough capacity under the North Sea to store CO2 from all the large CO2 point sources around the rim of the North Sea. capture and storage leads to a number of really crucial long-term issues. Who is going to be monitoring the storage sites for thousands and thousands of years? The companies that are now proposing projects clearly won't be able to do that. They won't be around for that long. Governments could be around for that long, maybe not. So we clearly need better frameworks that help us to decide who's going to be liable. And in addition, I would say this problem really reinforces the fact that energy conservation and renewable energy are the real long-term solution because carbon capture and storage may have a role to play but also raises a number of very complicated ethical issues.
Thank you.